Tonight, I'm very excited to welcome DC's own Asma Tiyudin for her vital new book, When Islam is Not a Religion, Inside America's Fight for Religious Freedom. Uh, Udin is a religious liberty lawyer who's worked on cases throughout the federal system up to and including the U.S. Supreme Court. Beyond that, she's also served uh, in many roles, uh, including as executive producer for the Emmy and Peabody Award nominated docuseries, The Secret Life of Muslims, and as the founding editor in chief of the website altmuslima.com, which publishes and highlights diverse commentary on gender within Islam from voices of all kinds. Beyond this book, uh, you can find her writing there at that website uh, and at a variety of other outlets from the New York Times to Teen Vogue to Refinery29. And you may have seen a piece of hers uh, in the Washington Post in March of this year uh, that really serves as an essential prelude to the substance of this book. Uh, that piece was published just after the, the massacre at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, and the article focuses on a claim made by uh, an Australian senator at the time laying the blame on Islam itself by framing the religion not as a religion but as a political ideology, uh, hence the title of this book. Uh, it's a notion that's gained steam among voices on the right in this country as well. And so Houdin raises the question, where does this leave the First Amendment rights of those studying, practicing, and living as Muslims? Uh, as presented in this book, uh, it's a legal question, it's a personal question, uh, and it's a question of media rhetoric that's a very urgent global necessity now and surely for years to come. Uh, tonight, she's joined in conversation by Michelle Borstein, who is a religion reporter for the Washington Post. So please join me in welcoming both speakers to Politics and Prose. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Speak up. Can you hear? Oh, okay, now it seems like it just kicked in. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, so, so this book is, as he said, a legal book. It's still off. It's, it's Talk directly on. into it? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so this is a legal book, but it's also a personal book. And I wanted to know if you could give us sort of the 60-second bio on you and how this wound up being your calling. And also for sort of historical context, what did that mean when you started? What did it mean to be focused on religious liberty? Sure. So I moved to D.C. about uh, 10 years ago, and I moved here because I was interested in working on questions at the intersection of religion and law. Uh, and there was only one law firm at the time that uh, worked on these issues and did it from the perspective of religion being a good, something that didn't that shouldn't be shut out from the public space, but that should be welcomed because religion is, is an inspiration for so much good for so many people. And that law firm is, uh, then was called the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty and is now called Beckett Law. And so I actually moved the family out. I used to do, I was working at a corporate firm in Philadelphia. Um, and as I tell people, I, I moved them out for about, you know, half the salary <laughs> to take on this job because I had noticed throughout my educational career that the one thing that I was really interested in always was was religion. Um, in, in undergrad, I majored. I ended up getting a third major in religion simply because I took too many classes. <laughs> um, and even before that, as a middle schooler, I um, I was the only one walking around with Karen Armstrong's The History of God. <laughs> <laughs> as a middle schooler. As a middle schooler, trying to spur interfaith dialogue. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you know, while I was in college, 9-11 um, happened. And that was an interesting turning point for me because prior to that, I had always thought of religion as in relatively warm and fuzzy terms, <laughs> religion as a source always of good, understanding there were some complexities, of course, uh, but that really kind of opened my eyes to sort of like a whole new space um, in which to consider religion. And so, so anyway, so I came out here 10 years ago um, because it was the one law firm that did this with the type of integrity and coherence. Um, it a firm that had people of diverse faiths representing people of every faith. Um, and that's how I got started. And so were you at that point, were you concerned about the place of religion in public life? I mean, you're, you're, you grew up in Miami. Your father was a, a community, a religious community leader. You write about in the book a little bit. So did that... Were you concerned about the place of religion in public life and that's what drew you to it? Or was it more just like, I'm interested in religion? 
Well, both. Um, you know, being, having gone to law school and taken a class in the religion clauses um, with a very sort of well-known scholar in the field, Philip Hamburger, uh, I knew that there were cases and controversies and, and, and situations in which religious believers were not permitted to, to live out their faith. And so, you know, I, I, I had that more intellectual understanding of it. Uh, up until that point, it was primarily sort of theoretical or intellectual, sort of reading the case studies and, and observing it that way. Um, but again, I mean, there were at the same time sort of up, increasingly new stories about what was happening um, with respect to American Muslims in the post 9-11 landscape, and not just Muslims, but also people mistaken as Muslims, uh, such as Sikh Americans. Um, and so, but one of the things I know in the book is that in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, there were definitely problems, um, but I think comparatively, the rate of hate crimes and other challenges to American Islam have, are, have de definitely taken sort of a spike in more recent years. And so, uh, just to go again, give people a little bit of historical context, the, so now we think of the term as, you know, being sort of charged and political and partisan religious liberty and religious freedom often, but in the nineties, um, some of the most landmark laws about it were passed by a democratic president. So can you help us explain a little how we got to where we are now? Like what did religious liberty mean then? And how, what, if again, a short version, just to tell people, how did religious liberty come to be sort of the somewhat divisive and challenging thing it is today? Just the short version, we'll go into it more later. Sure. And I think um, having been in the space and working on cases in, uh, up till this, the US Supreme Court, um, I was sort of at the center of a lot of those changes that were happening. Um, and so you mentioned these a couple of um, major developments in, the 19, in both 1993, which was the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, which was year, near unanimous, and then 2000, the passage of the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, again, widely bipartisan. And so for a long time, religious liberty was relatively um, uncontroversial. I mean, I think our biggest sort of culture war was about whether or not we should have Christmas displays in, in the public square. And when I came to the law firm in 2009, that was essentially the sort of mode of religious liberty that that I was familiar with, and that I and that was interesting, and the issues that we worked on. And then about you know in about so I guess it was 2014, um, we were both represented and won um, on behalf of Hobby Lobby, um, the craft stores, um, in a very contentious case at the U.S. Supreme Court. And many of you might be familiar with that, and that might be coloring me in a totally different way for a number of you. Um, and that, you know, but uh, the law firm came at it from a place of, this is a law and the government didn't do a good job in drafting the particular law that's being challenged and we're gonna challenge it. And so, you know, and then a, a legal issue being a legal issue in terms of jurisprudence, it just didn't hold up um, in court. And so, but of course, right after Hobby Lobby, I think there's been a completely different uh, sort of era in religious liberty. Increasingly now we see religious freedom discussed uh, with scare quotes around it, around the frame, uh, the phrase. Um, and so religious freedom now is something that a lot of people are uh, generally cynical about. I see. So, so that, okay. So that, so you see Hobby Lobby as like a key moment, mm -hmm. a key transitional moment. Um, is there anything more that we could say about the period before then, like the couple decades before then of how, how that came to be. Obviously Hobby Lobby was making it, was making, the case was there because they were making an argument that they were suppressed. So, I mean, has the expression of religious freedom become more limited in the decades before Hobby Lobby? Like what was, what was the run up to that in a general way? Well, I mean, I think framed in, in sort of the broader sort of culture war terms that are that we hear about in public discourse and that scenario there is i mean we we increasingly hear about many conservative christians feeling that there is um that that, that they are essentially being persecuted mm -hmm. uh what one article sort of desc described it as the moral majority now becoming the persecuted minority mm -hmm. and this is a, a, a real thing i mean some people who who don't share those beliefs have sometimes have a hard time understanding that this is it's a genuine fear uh, that many of these people have. And so in that context, it was definitely perceived as the Obama, Obama administration, the greater sort of agenda of secularism, uh, trying to uh, you know, force them to uh, 
to violate their most deeply held religious beliefs. Right. So into that, you mentioned that you were working at Beckett. So tell people a little bit who don't know. Again, there's just a quick version. If we, we can go into it more if people want to. But who are the players when we talk about religious freedom? I mean, in D.C., sometimes we might tend to think about law firms and advocacy firms. I mean, who are there... Are there important influencers that people should know if they're thinking like, who are the ones who are discussing this term, funding this term? Like, is it, is it primarily law firms and advocacy firms in DC? Is it national? Like who are, what is the infrastructure when we talk about religious freedom? Who care, who is dedicated to it? Yeah, so there's a number of law firms. Um, there is again, Beckett Law, there's the Alliance Defending Freedom, um, which is uh, as I understand it, uh, defined as a Christian organization and has all Christian attorneys um, largely defending Christian causes. Um, there's, uh, on the Muslim side, there's Muslim advocates. Uh, there is CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, there's MPAC, who, that, that doesn't engage in litigation, but, also, but does speak out and write about these issues. Uh, there's a Heritage Foundation that takes positions on religious liberty issues. There's just a, a wide, I mean, the Center for American Progress has a, has a position on religious freedom. The ACLU takes on cases. Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Um, the uh, um, the Baptist Joint Committee. Um, Do you get the sense that it's as active outside of D.C. or that we're sort of an industry here? Well, I mean, there's definitely you know, chapters of these various organizations um, throughout the U.S., but I think it is probably the most sort of vibrant space if you're if you're interested in religious freedom. Um, and of course, represented in my own story that I was interested in the question in religious freedom and working on those cases. And I, I had to move to D.C. for that. So how tell us how you fit into that. You talked about, you know, a lot of these organizations are, you know, focused on Christian concerns around Christians, which are obviously the majority, vast majority of faith in the United States. So what was it like for you as someone who came into it concerned about Islam? Were there many other people from your perspective? Um, did you find it was challenging? Did you find people welcoming? Do you think there's bias? Like, what was it like being you in that world? Yeah, so I think that I definitely occupy a unique space because the number, the different organizations that I essentially you know, laid out um, tend to take one position on religious freedom or the other. And so there's, a, if you, can, you can easily sort of group a lot of these, um, these different entities into one or the other groups. And one side is the side that is, uh, that has a really broad understanding of religious freedom, one that advocates for it on behalf of everyone from conservative Christians to Muslims to Sikhs. Um, so I guess that's actually a unique positioning. Um, that, uh, that's a, a very unique Beckett positioning. Um, but even more, I guess, to the right of that would be people who largely see that in terms of Christian and, and to some extent Jewish interests. Um, and then on the flip side are people who think of religious freedom as it's being talked about in the public discourse. Those are the people who kind of think of it essentially Whitsker quotes and are trying to sort of reimagine uh, religious freedom, which they think of primarily as a pro as a protection for for minorities. Um, which it was originally, right? I mean, not, not originally, but when the movement, like in the 90s, when people talked about religious freedom, my understanding is it was pro it, there was a lot of focus on protecting minorities before the concern about the majority. Is that right? That there was a time when when people said religious freedom, they were generally talking about protecting smaller religious minorities. Right. Although I would also add to that, that I think the majority didn't feel at the time that it needed as many protections as minorities. Right. And that sense of, again, of persecution and anxiety has itself shifted. Mm -hmm. So now that the majority or people that we are used to thinking of as a majority um, feel like, feel, feel like a minority. Right. right. So was that challenging for you? Like, what was it like personally? I mean, did that was it sort of a non-issue because you had your own motivations, or is there any are there any stories or kind well, of I mean, experiences? That it, it's interesting, right? Because I have to constantly negotiate the space in which, um, you know, so as an American Muslim who's wor who's worked on a range of cases, including conservative Christian cases, it's often, unfortunately, a lot of the anti-Muslim rhetoric does come from very conservative circles. And so it's all, it's, it's a little bit confusing for, for many Muslims to see me uh, working on behalf of them and, and defending them. I, you know, when I was working on the Hobby Lobby case and was reaching out to a number of Muslim owned businesses to see if they would sign on to a multi-faith um, amicus brief. Um, I remember getting just a really angry email from somebody who heads up a, a very sort of large um, lucrative business here in, in the US. 
um, essentially saying, well, you know, the, the, the Green family the, that owns a Hobby Lobby distributes Bibles across the Muslim world and is trying to co convert um, Muslims. And, uh, you know, how could you be defending these people? And, and then there was, of course, also the, the element where they felt that this was an anti-woman um, position and that by defending them, you're, you're waging a war on women. Um, and it was interesting because the end of the email is like, and I'm not interested in discussion on this. <laughs> and it was just like, okay. okay. Um, but it was, you know, but that's essentially the the space that that I'm in where sometimes I have to navigate this uh, sort of the path where it's like, well, look, this, is, this isn't a question of whether or not I agree with them distributing uh, Bibles in the Muslim world and trying to convert my fellow, you know, my co-religionists. I mean, I, I think they have the, the freedom to do that. I don't, am I happy about that? No. Um, but it, my defense of their principles, um, especially under U.S. law, um, is a completely different and separate matter. And I don't understand why one issue should be affecting uh, the ability of, uh, for, for us to sort of advocate for people with, with integrity and coherence. Right. So you're trying to be very logical when people are feeling also like emotional and yeah, that sort of and thing. Yeah. And a lot of what this book is about is just kind of my telling other people who... Can you also be logical? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, when it comes to Islam, there's just so much, you know, widespread uh, misunderstanding and a lot of um, fear and also a lot of hate. And it's just like it's always like this conflation of like what's going on abroad and what they understand about Islam and right. and and all these different things that they've been led to believe about Islam. Uh, some of them justified by various news headlines. And it's just like, well, look, what you believe about a certain religious practice is should be kept distinct from the question of whether or not uh, it's protected under the U.S. Constitution. Right. In your book, you talked about, you know, um, I forget in the beginning what the data source you cited, but it had to do with measures of religious freedom in different countries, including Muslim majority countries overseas. <laughs> and, you know, basically you're, you were coming back to this is about America. This is about our laws here. And that's how you see it. Like that doesn't justify, you know, that you're, you're addressing our legal system and that those arguments don't pertain. But I think to, to many people they do. So that's a hard line for you to walk, you know, because people want to engage, engage in talking about faith in general in very broad terms. And you're always trying to say, okay, let's talk about like the cases that have happened in the United States and what are the important, important case law. And I guess you're a very focused person. <laughs> And I'm grateful for that. I think that the fact that I have legal training in this has given me the ability to sort of like sift through things just like in ways that I think other people just have a hard time kind of separating out. But yeah, it was very intentional. There's the American flag on the front, you know, cover of the book. And on the <laughs> napkins. Like, yes, on the napkins. <laughs> and it's red, white, and blue over there. Um, it's like, this is about America. This is about our rights in America. I, I get it. You're concerned about what's going on abroad. I'm concerned too. In fact, I've worked on a number of those cases. Um, but we need to keep those, those issues distinct. So, so let's get to, um, your motivation to, to write the book. So would, do you think that you would have, like, was this an evolution for you that you came to this, to the, to sort of the, con this concern or this idea that there's a building case being made that Islam is not a religion? Like, would you have expected if I told you 10 years ago that you might think this is a priority to write a book about, like, was that part of your journey to sort of say, look, let's talk about this one faith. It's my faith, but it's under a particular type of challenge. Well, no, I mean, 10 years ago, again, I knew that different religious groups had different challenges. Um, when I started off in this space, I didn't think of Islam being um, sort of the target of, of a very sort of strategic movement to deny uh, Muslims um, legal rights. Um, in 2010, which is about a year actually after I started um, doing this work, I was involved in a case uh, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, dealing with the Islamic Center in Murfreesboro that wanted to build a mosque. And it was the first time, and again, I was, I was a junior attorney, this is like totally new to the field. Um, and, but it was the first time, not just for, for me and for the other attorneys there that had heard uh, this argument being made in court that the the Muslim community should not be able to build a mosque, that the various county approval process processes should have been different for Muslims as compared to other houses of worship. And the argument was the reason for that is because Islam is not a religion. It's like this dangerous political ideology. It poses security threats to this community. Mosques, in fact, are uh, the equivalent of sort of Trojan horses that are being planted in American suburbs, out of which these extremists are going to emerge and take over America. Um, and these were these are actual arguments made over a multi-day hearing 
in an American court. Um, and the U.S. Department of Justice in 2010 actually had to get involved in a chancery court case and file a brief stating that the that the U.S. government considers Islam to be a religion. And it was just like... In the Murfreesboro case? In the Murfreesboro case. And so just sort of watching this sort of take place, um, it was incredible. And I think um, I processed it, you know, personally and emotionally, but part of me was also like, this has to be a one-off. This is just so bizarre. Um of course, what you know, what at the time, the fact that the Department of Justice had to get involved was a clue in itself that they the, that the government was was concerned that it worthy of their um, of their you know participation, um, and also the fact that it was allowed to go on for days in court. So, it, which suggests to me that the judge was sympathetic to some degree <laughs> to this to this uh, this claim. And then since then, um, it is something that I see coming up in various forms. It's sometimes said in those precise words, Islam is not a religion. Sometimes it's said more indirectly, um, such as the entire corpus of Islamic law called Sharia is actually a political tool for the takeover of America. Um, that's another way of saying Islam is not a religion. Um, and, and, I, and, I've, and I've heard it from people increasingly in, in increasingly uh, prominent positions. And how does that fit into, I mean, people have been, have been dealing, we've been dealing with religious liberty issues since there's been a, an America. I mean, different groups that have been, you know, had suffered legal discrimination here or there. So how does that fit into, like, is this just, do you see this as kind of, this is part of the continuum, whether there's Mormons or Catholics mm -hmm. or Jews, Muslims, like, is it, it's not, um, is it new in in some way? Is there something from a legal perspective that you feel like that maybe that maybe the campaign, like you're talking about to single it out? I mean, is there something that could help us kind of put it in context? Yeah. So the, this idea of, of dual loyalty, this idea that people, these people, people being Muslims in this case, cannot be trusted is because they have this loyalty to something that's anti-American values, American constitution. And a lot of times because of, there are Muslim majority states uh, across the world um, doing things that many Americans find problematic. There's this idea, well, Muslims in America are inherently tied to Muslims abroad. And that idea is something that has come up with respect to other religious groups throughout American history. Um, it's one that uh, the Catholics had to deal with in uh, in the 19th century um, and up until even 19, the 1960s when um, when J JFK was uh, running for president, he had to deal with this claim that he was, had ultimate allegiance to the Pope as compared to the U.S. government um, members of uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormons, um, also had to deal with this, uh, perhaps best uh, reflected um, in the 1903 Reed Smoot hearings that went on for four years, where a U.S. senator um, was remained unseated because there was this questioning about whether or not he had allegiance to his church um, versus um, the U.S. Constitution. Uh, we've dealt with this, and with uh, with respect to Jewish Americans. Um, and there's, I mean, there's an ongoing trend where we, where we see these types of arguments being made against a religious group that is disfavored and feared in various ways. Um, I think that the, the current context, I mean, each of those situations is always going to be different, right? And it's always sort of pushing the American sort of constitutional order to sort of to contend with something that hasn't dealt with before and to become broadened um, and, you know, in, in sort of in that relationship with complexity. And I think in this scenario, it is American Muslims and Islam generally that are kind of presenting the new challenge uh, to ideals of American pluralism. And I think that just everything that's going on in the world, I mean, it's it's hard not to see it as also distinct, mm -hmm. even though there's so, there's so much similarity, but we also live in a in different time, uh, a time where we're all scared of extremism and terrorism coming from all kinds of different motivations. Um, you know, worlds where with social media, I think that there's a, a big impact there with just the way that communities are connected. Um, and also, I think with the with the broad politicization of religion, um, you're you're kind of dealing with this in a context in which the majority feels threatened, but threatened in, and they were threatened in all those other cases as well. But I think it's just it's a, it's a different it's a different type of threat um, because it's also matched with changes in, in demographics and, um, you know, what some people call the end of white Christian America. And, and so I think that is leading to sort of a heightened sense of anxiety. Yeah. I wanted to, to, um, I'm glad you just elaborated on like the other contexts going on today. And I wanted to just, you know, 
to, to continue that a little bit about what might be going on particularly today. I remember doing a profile sometime in the last 10 years of the Beckett founder. I don't remember if you were there at the time, but um, he, he had talked at the time about how when the firm was founded, there were people who, at this religious liberty law firm that weren't comfortable with religious minorities being hired there. So, I mean, the rea there is a reality to, you know, some of, some of that, um, I guess you could say bias. And I don't know if you think that that's something that we shouldn't downplay, you know, that like that, this is just an, this is just another, another form of sort of social anxiety and just a, you know, a phase, like, is that something that is that you find to be a serious, a serious concern, you know, that there is something particular about, well, I guess so, that's why you wrote a book about it. But I mean, like that there is a concern about Islam that is, you know, heightened, you know, that isn't just like, that maybe isn't exactly like uh, uh, all these other phases. I mean, I, I do remember, um, you know, again, this is Beckett, as she talked about, is one of the firms that's known for taking on other more diverse clients um, in this realm of religious law, uh, religious freedom law firms. And I don't think that they got involved in the travel ban case and the Muslim Center in Lower Manhattan, which were two very prominent cases. So I'm just wondering if you could unpack a little bit more, like how you how you engage with that. You know, I mean, I don't just mean like emotionally, but you're, you're making a case. I assume you're in these, you're in these rooms kind of making a case for why this needs to be taken on as just any other religious freedom issue. Is that right? Or tell me if I'm way off. Right. So I feel like that's like five questions in one. Oh, sorry. That's <laughs> oh. an issue I have, <laughs> oh, but take whichever one you think is most productive. So on whether or not I think this is serious, a serious threat. I mean, yes, the fact that I wrote about it, um, you know, I do feel like they're the types of arguments that are being made and the, the people making them uh, and the sort of possible sort of effects, um, both ones that we can foresee and ones that I, I think are all already in place, uh, do have a direct concrete impact on the scope of, of legal rights for, in this scenario, in specifically in terms of the fact patterns for, for American Muslims. But the point with the book was really to explain that the way that religious freedom and all of our human rights work is that it, it, they have to have, there, ha, there has to be coherence in the way that we advocate and, the, and then and that we legislate these issues. Um, because it's when you begin to sort of create exceptions, uh, you essentially end up creating exceptions that then are encapsulated in the law, and now you have permanently sort of ceded power to the government, uh, which in the future, when there's a, a different um, uh, religious group uh, that the government or the majority uh, has fears and concerns about, then those are the ones that are up next in terms of having their rights restricted. And so it's really kind of the long-term view. It's like, yes, I can speak from my sort of unique vantage point, from my different professional and personal and religious uh, viewpoints as to why I think this is of an urgent concern. But many people who don't occupy my space might not see the urgency. And I really kind of wanted to make that clear for the reader to say, hey, this impacts you no matter who you are. And what are the, what are the key cases that people should be watching on this? Like if I was a a lawyer in your world, like what are the, what are the key cases or key issues that get at this question? Pluralism, religious diversity, religious freedom, that kind of thing. Well, um, I mean, in terms of some of the, the anti-mosque controversies that I talked about in the book, it's one that um, in its most recent iteration kind of started with the so-called ground zero mosque uh, debacle that happened um, in 2009, 2010. Um, the first mosque to be affected by that controversy was the Murfreesboro Mosque uh, in Tennessee. And since that's then... That's the land, land use rule. That's the land use rules or what's the Right. So framework? the ability to build a house of worship. Um, and now, I mean, since 2010, the anti-mosque controversies have spread across the nation. Um, the My friends at the Department of Justice will tell you that in all of their uh, Muslim mosque cases or cases involving the construction of Muslim cemeteries, they consistently hear among the opposition. Again, now it doesn't happen so much in, in court, but it'll happen outside official channels. But you can tell that what's motivating the opposition is again, this idea of um, Islam is not a religion. It's a common talking point. Um, it is instead a dangerous political ideology. These guys are, um, another thing that's really widely held is the idea that all American Muslims are essentially acting good um, and just an attempt to kind of come into power by tricking everyone into thinking that we're good. Um, and then once we are in power, we're going to take over the U.S. Um, this is a, an, 
a national belief. It's widely held and it's definitely at the core of um, the anti-mosque controversies, which, by the way, don't just end with the legal challenges. Um, I mean, there's been a spate of of arson attacks. I mean, there's houses of worship of all types that are that are dealing with this and and that I speak about in the book. Um, we all are familiar with the Tree of Life synagogue shooting, um, the shooting at Oak Creek uh, Sikh Temple. Um, and so, and, and again, I think that highlights for, for me that the the urgency of it, even this moment, while I might feel ac- acutely and because of the fact that anti-Muslim hate crimes are the fastest growing um, and are so widespread, there's that particular urgency, but there's also urgency with respect to these other religious minorities um, that are they're feeling these effects. And of course, beyond that, there's the bigger question right now going on between sort of the more quote unquote culture war issues around um, certain, um, you know, conservative Christian concerns about their ideas about uh, sexual freedom and the extent to which the government is forcing them to accept uh, certain beliefs about sexuality that they are morally opposed to. If, what about behind the scenes for lawyers who really, you know, we all are probably familiar with that tension between, you know, civil rights and religious liberty. Behind the scenes, do people think like, okay, there's one or two or three principles that are going to be hashed out in court in the next whatever, 10, 20, 30, 40 years that like will define whether we will live as a pluralistic country, religiously pluralistic country or not? Like, is there some, from a, just from a lawyer's perspective, what is it that people are talking about? Well, I mean, definitely this question of um, the negotiation of religious liberty and sexual freedom is is a big issue, um, even with uh, you know, the, the announcement by the Secretary of State of the new Commission on Unalienable Rights, that, that in itself has sort of started this new conver- this conversation about, well, is this a way of kind of creating a hierarchy of rights to help you know influence that negotiation? Maybe you should tell people what that is in case they didn't see it. I don't know if they saw that. Well, I mean, it's a it's a commission that is uh, only has advisory capacity um, and uh, to the secretary of state. And its job is essentially to sort of advise on the diff- the the challenges to natural law rights. So they're creating a distinction between, for instance, rights such as religious freedom and versus rights that they think are sort of more in terms of the new lingo and don't, don't arise from natural law origins. Um in which they, for instance, um, uh, LGBT rights would be one of those. And so the criticism has been that there is this this hierarchy that's being created that ultimately, even though the members of the commission will keep saying, no, this is entirely outwardly focused, we're looking at issues internationally, um, the fear of that a number of American commentators have voiced is that this is a way of kind of weighing in on that uh, the, the sort of the battle between religious freedom and sexual freedom. Right. And we, and also, um, speaking of the secretary of state next week, they're ho- hosting a major meeting on international religious liberty. Uh, and that's drawing, you know, in, obviously international issues are different to some degree, but they'll have a lot of the same players and give a lot of probably, I don't know, maybe a, a lot of media attention to the issue. Um, tell me uh, a little bit about what you think the impact of this administration has been on religious liberty. Do you think, Can you be specific, positive, negative, specific policies? What's going to be the legacy of the Trump administration? Right. I mean, so in some, in large part, I think it depends on who you ask. Um, You know, the 2016 presidential elections were uh, dubbed by Ted Cruz uh, as a religious liberty election. And then a number of GOP presidential candidates sort of competed with each other in terms of showing just how dedicated they were uh, to the cause of religious freedom. Uh, and as I point out in the book, simultaneous to this sort of uh, you know championing um, of religious liberty, there were also proposals being made by a number of them to create a Muslim registry, to ban, uh, to ban Muslims, to surveil quote unquote Muslim neighborhoods, uh, to shut down mosques. And so this was, I mean, if you're talking about what might have sort of alerted me uh, to the question of, um, you know, the hypocrisy and the incoherence in the way that we're advocating for rights, that was definitely a, a very clear example. The fact that you can both think of yourself as as a, as a defender of religious freedom and, and then also be proposing things that are in the most basic sense um, anti-religious freedom. And so, again, that that contrast has continued in terms of a lot of the policies by the Trump administration in um, 
in the various, for instance, uh, they're considering uh, relooking at the rules uh, for funding for faith-based uh, schools. Um, they have created this ministerial for the uh, for the advancement of religious freedom um, at the state. Is the department. funding the funding of religious schools meaning what? Can you be a little more specific? Well, I think just this idea again. What is that? Like, is it is an act, an actual sort of violation of? Um, the establishment clause and principles oh. under free exercise in terms of providing federal funding for parochial schools. Um, and so that's an, that's an issue. And then we see that uh, we see the State Department working on um, this sort of effort. A lot of people who went to last year's ministerial did voice concerns that they felt that it was uh, imbalanced, that there was largely a focus on um, Christian persecution abroad. Uh, my event, I held a side event uh, towards the, uh, the very end of the ministerial in which my case was, uh, my, my event was the only one that discussed the travel ban case, which had been decided just three weeks prior to the ministerial. And here's like this huge international uh, convening on religious freedom and nobody was talking about the travel ban case. Are you, are um, you going next week? Are you involved next week? I am. I mean, oh. I'll be I'll be in and out. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know if you were having and another July, panel. July 15th on Monday, as a side event to the ministerial, I will be speaking at the New America Foundation, mm -hmm. and it's open and free to the public. Is um, Does someone mind telling me what time it is? I think it's about 20 minutes of 7.40. Oh, okay. We're good. Okay. Um, and so... <laughs> You know, obviously, you talked about it in the book this, the condition of of you know of Muslims in the United States. What do you think the the uh, the prospects are for for religious pluralism in the United States? Do you think that we, you know, we're we're really straining right now? It seems like as a country to kind of wrestle with religious identity, and and it goes beyond just you know Muslim, Christian, Jewish. It's you know, liberal conservative who gets to define, you know, I don't know your personal view if you feel like, you know, how will we define religion in the future? I mean, it's, you know, denominations are losing grip and power. I mean, it, do you think, do you feel, I don't mean to simplify it, but I mean, do you feel optimistic about our ability to negotiate this? I don't know if there's a, much of a precedent, but do you think that we can negotiate this or do you think we're going backwards a little bit? Well, I mean, I think the precedent in, in many ways is the previous negotiations we've had uh, with difficult you know, issues and, and groups that have caused the majority some a lot of concern about their place in America. Again, as I said earlier, I do think the challenges today are unique. Um, but I think if we were to look at um, American history, that we see that there is an ability of of us as a nation to move past uh, even very sort of dire cases of, of anti-religious hatred, whether it be the actual sort of rioting and massacres that happen against Catholics and the burning down of churches, whether it be the the, the governor of Missouri um, issuing an extermination order to, to kill Mormons. Um, you know, we've seen some really, really crazy things. And I think that, um, you know, I always sort of see that as like, well, in comparison to that, in many ways, we're in a better place. But I think the, the unique challenges that we have today, I think it's really just about whether or not we're able to stay true to our founding ideals. And I think that if we are, I think we'll, we'll be okay. Um, but I think that the fact that the very sort of nature of human rights is being politicized and, and questioned by so, by so many Americans and from so many different angles, um, I think poses um, a, serious, a serious challenge. So just before I open up to questions, I just wanted to go back to the personal for a minute. In the book, you talk a little bit about um, your own faith journey and whether that was thinking when you were thinking about getting married and you talked about your son and sort of discouraging him from talking about, you know, scriptural stories in school to protect him. I was just wondering, like, where how this has affected your faith journey. If you, you know, some I've heard from many Muslims since 9-11 reporting about it, that people were sort of forced in a sense to plunge into a faith journey that they may or may not have taken otherwise. And I was just wondering, you know, and you've also, you know, you write in the book about looking into Islam in other countries and the very wide variety of ways people practice and fr free in some places and very, you know, not free in other parts of the Muslim world, just like if it's affected you as a Muslim, if you feel like you're a different Muslim person than you would have been, you know, before this, if uh, delving into it from a legal perspective and all the religious freedom issues. Yeah. I mean, so I talk a lot in the book also about my father, as Jen mentioned earlier, which to me is sort of like the perfect representative of like a great American, um, because he contributed in very concrete ways to, uh, 
to the very construction of America. I mean, he moved down to South Florida at a time when it was relatively undeveloped. And, you know, his imprint is all over the city of Miami. Uh, you know, he, he designed um, large parts of the Miami International Airport, the seaport, the public schools there, the affordable the, um, uh, housing uh, communities. And so he's just, he's all over. Like, and he passed away. I speak of him in the past tense because he passed away almost 13 years ago. And one of the other things I remember about my father is he was just somebody who was unapologetically Muslim. And I think these days that phrase is used in a different way. Um, but the way that I mean that is that he just was like, you know, I this is what the truth is. And God wants me to be a good person, to engage in religious worship. We have to pray five times a day. The prophet said that all the world is a mosque. If it's time to pray, you got to pray. And so he was he was that guy who pulled out the prayer mat from the trunk of his car. And if it was time, he would pray right next to his car in the parking lot um, or he would pray in the mall. And, you know, as a kid, you know, there were times that I was obviously embarrassed by that. But other times I was like, you know, I was like, oh, prayer time's running out. I'm going to join him. Um, and so but, you know, it was just kind of like the most it was a question of embarrassment. Like, oh, the people are probably wondering, you know, what are we doing? Um, but now it's like, a, it's a totally different situation. And then one of the stories I share in the book is, uh, is on how on the 4th of July, when we go out to the banks of the Potomac river, uh, to kind of watch the fireworks and necessarily the fireworks don't start until, uh, sundown, um, they actually start right at sundown. Um, and that is also the time for the, the sunset prayer. And you only have about like 30 minutes generally to complete that prayer. Um, and so I, I'm routinely in this position of then having to go and find a spot to pray. And I have this designated willow tree under which I pray. Um, but the types of concerns that I have are not just like, oh, people might think I'm weird, um, but more so people might think I am a security threat, mm -hmm. <laughs> which of course has been the case. Uh, for instance, there have been cases of Muslims play praying in public spaces and you know people calling uh, legal authorities on them. So if people have questions, we could turn to questions for a bit. Does anyone want to ask a question? I certainly have plenty of questions if you're not. <laughs> is there a microphone? Oh, there is a microphone. Okay. So thank you. I, I, I'm a public school teacher um, and in, in, in suburban high school here. And I've noticed in the last three, three to five years, there's been a lot of discussion now about um, you know the lack of you know, religion in a public school, and that's some of the problems with the schools. And I, and thankfully, it hasn't been a big issue for me personally in the schools that I teach at. But I'm just curious what your thoughts would be about, like, where this intersection with, you know, religious freedom and public schools are is headed in the next five to ten years. Right. So I'm a little nervous answering that because we have like the ultimate expert sitting right there, um, <laughs> Ben Marcus, um, from the Religious Freedom Center. Um, and so if you want to chime in and add to that, you can definitely do that. Um, but my understanding, of course, is that um, you can teach about religion, um, but it's, it's that's distinct from um, what you start validating the religious beliefs or sort of engaging in religious truth claims, um, but, but more so teach it as a as a subject or almost like a sort of secular study of, of religion um, that you can acknowledge and celebrate and uh, religious holidays without necessarily engaging in them again from a position of um, you know, being of worship. Um, and so I think that nowadays, because of a lot of the challenges that are happening with the teaching and accommodation of religious practices in public schools, I think that increasingly a lot of public schools are just afraid of sort of just doing anything because of the fear of litigation. And the particular sort of angle, you know, the aspect of that, that I, that's relevant to the broader conversation here is this challenge that I, I've been, sort of the series of challenges I've been seeing um, against the, either the incorporation of different types of um, activities, like such as yoga and meditation practices that are being challenged um, by various groups as an establishment of, of Hinduism or Buddhism. Um, I think that's interesting that even though it's, it's a very sort of secular practice of those things it, um, that they're being challenged in that regard, I think that kind of comes from what we were talking about, a place of a lot of sort of fear and anxiety about what um, America is becoming. Um, and I think when, and with respect to Muslims specifically, you see, for instance, just the most sort of minute accommodations for fasting students. You see uh, being, being challenged, you see accommodation, uh, you see uh, uh, anti-Muslim bullying, and simply like anti anti-bullying programs that in this scenario might focus on Muslims because understanding that 42% of Muslim students are uh, face some sort of bullying in public schools, K through, K through 12, 
Um, some schools have instituted these anti-bullying programs specifically helping Muslims, and that is actually being challenged uh, by various groups as a so-called establishment um, of Islam. <laughs> And I just, just chime in really briefly on that because I'm definitely so interested in the public school stuff. I've, I feel like the, a lot of the issue is the ignorance around what's legal to teach and ignorance about religion in general among Americans. And so I think teachers don't feel confident. First, they think it's illegal. And second, they don't feel confident about teaching. And I think our social anxiety and division around religion, I'm pretty like sort of yeah, I feel pretty negative about our chances of being able to move forward with that because it have to be a real investment in educating people and giving us the confidence to talk with each other about about what people believe. And anyway, thanks for letting me chime in. Um, was there another question? This is sort of a two part question. The first part is a backhanded uh promo for you. So when you, you were asked kind of who's interested in working, speaking in the space, writing in the space, convening in the space, and you didn't mention the Religious Freedom Center, and I know you have an affiliation with that, so does that guy over well, I there. I was trying to, I was trying to navigate the two sides okay. of the politics, and these guys are... Okay, but so I'm, I'm giving a plug to that. But, the, but uh, the second thing is really more sort of serious, which is... Um, you know, putting aside any particular religion, how would we know when a religion really does uh, sponsor, you know, hatred and is not legitimate? You know, our, our jurisprudence really, I think rightfully, doesn't want to get into that. So how would we know? And the American, you know, the, Amer all right, the American public is very confused on this point, I think, and it's you know, right, learn, rightly something we don't talk about publicly. You know, it gets to kind of picking what's legitimate and what's not. Right. Um, so I, when you say our jurisprudence doesn't want to get into this, but the jurisprudence does get into this um, by right. instituting a test that says that, that those concerns are only relevant as needed, right? So, for instance, the, 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 the standard in... Uh, cases involving uh, restrictions on religious exercise, uh, depending on which statute and which um, you know constitutional provision is coming under, um, is essentially the, the strict scrutiny standard, which does have this balancing between the, the government having a compelling interest in restricting a particular practice um, and whether or not the various government action or the law in question is the best way of serving that interest. In other words, is there a way of serving that interest without limiting religious practice? Or if we're worried, for instance, you know, if you, if you think about an example just abroad, uh, in terms of the French uh, ban on the wearing of face veils, they say that the government interest in that case is uh, women's equality and trying to protect women from oppression. And whereas there's so many people, so many women who wear uh, face veils out of free will, and and it's, it's completely voluntary. It's a an example of their um, you know religious uh, piety. And so if you're concerned about women's oppression, the mo the the best way to solve that question is to in, in, in for the government to engage and to promote various measures that get get to the heart of the matter, right? So anti-domestic violence and anti other forces forces a. Uh, of um, coercion in in the private realm, because again, the idea is that there's like this domineering male that is forcing the female to wear the face veil, and so the, and the so the French government's going to come in and save her by basically banning all people from wearing face veils. Never mind the reality that if the person was an actually oppressive household, then she probably wouldn't be able to leave the household now because she's not doesn't have her face covered. And so that's just an example of like just because I think so those those states and those governments don't have. The type of developed jurisprudence on this question, nor do they have an interest in developing uh, a one that in, in to protect sort of the robust expression of religion in the public square. And so they make these mistakes. And but from an American perspective, an American legal perspective, we can see those mistakes because we do we we do believe in in broad sort of public expression of religion. And the way that we negotiate something like that, the reason that we don't have an all encompassing uh, religious garb ban is because we understand that whatever our specific concerns are, we need to come up with measures that address those concerns and are not overbroad. And so our jurisprudence, and to sort of like to, to, to recap or sort of sum it up, um, you know, our jurisprudence absolutely deals with this question. And it says what you what you believe and what what sort of things are going on in your mind for the large for for pretty much uh, for the most part 
is irrelevant to the government because religious freedom protects your ability to believe whatever you want. Uh, you have like pretty much absolute protection for that. It's only the point at which you take those beliefs and then implement them into action that then the government can determine whether or not it can come up with a good way to stop an action that I think um, sort of threatens American public order. Is there a question over here? Um, in, in Western countries, uh, religious freedom is uh, based in great part on a secular state. Uh, is the Shia law, the Muslim faith, uh, can it accept a secular state? Because without a secular state, there can be no religious freedom. So there was another book that came out recently on, it's called Islam and Religious Freedom. And the, the scholar who wrote the book did the survey of all Muslim majority states. And he found that there were about 14% of them that are majority Muslim and are completely religiously free. Then he found that of the remainder, about 40% of Muslim majority states are actually um, sort of sec uh, secularists, or hyper secularists. They sort of use France as their model, where it's not that they were they're, they're trying to enforce Islam, but they're actually trying to enforce secularism. And so Muslims, in addition to other people of other religious uh, backgrounds, are sort of pushed out of the public square uh, in terms of their religious expression because the state is trying to enforce a type of secularity. Um, and then, of course, the, re the, the other, uh, the remaining um, Muslim majority states that he looked at do have this idea that religion has to necessarily be tied up with government. But I think the way that you sort of phrase that question is sort of like it's sort of inherent, right? Sort of it's, it's inherent to the question of, of Islam and Sharia and um, and Islamic law that there has to be this sort of this melding of of religion and state. But in fact, the reality on the ground, again, sort of brought out by the scholar and others working in the space. Um, is the fact that there is tremendous diversity. And so that, that sort of inherent connection is, is challenged. Thank you. Hi, uh, I had a question in terms of what you'd hope folks would uh, learn from the book. And I think you've mentioned uh, previously that the book is coming out when the country has got a, a certain level of polarization. And religious liberty is one of these concepts um, that we tend to get polarized over. So you might have two potential audiences. One might be an audience that sees itself as being very sympathetic uh, to, to folks who are um, Muslim and of a minority faith and dealing with a lot of uh, bigotry and hostility, uh, but might be skeptical of the concept of religious liberty. And another audience you might have might be folks who are, are very excited about the concept of religious liberty, um, but may have uh, questions or concerns or misunderstandings about Islam. And I was just wondering what you would hope those two different potential audiences might take away from your book. Sure. So one of them is what I hope that I've been doing Do you in this wait context. For somebody to shut off that phone. Um, is somebody's phone going off? Could maybe we hit that ringer? Maybe it's off. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I mean, so I think the one one. So a couple of different things. Um, I think one that we've kind of seen in the in the course of this Q and A happening right here, where one of the gentlemen asked me, sort of, what do we do? How do uh, with people who hold crazy, possibly like really dangerous ideas? And it's to to explain the sort of the difference between sort of people having crazy ideas um, versus people doing crazy things, and then the fact that we have a jurisprudence that uh, that negotiates that very well. So I think so much of the fear that we have on both sides of the, of the coin that you described right now, whether it be concerns about uh, Christians or whether it be concerns about Muslims, I mean, let's just say or the, or the, or the religious majority versus a religious minority. In both of those cases, there's just like this fear that somehow our legal system is just not sufficient, is just not capable of negotiating uh, the types of things that we're worried are going to come to fruition. And so I think the, the, the big thing with the both that I really want to get through is Everybody just relax. We have a really good, solid uh, jurisprudence. I, I point out some of the problems and the concerns that I have in terms of, for instance, the biases held um, by uh, a number of federal judges against um, 
against Muslims as proven by empirical evidence. Um, and so there's definitely space for critique and improvement, but on the whole, our jurisprudence and our constitutional framework provide the types of um, you know, the, the safety and the ability to negotiate um, between complex issues. And I think the other thing is um, speaking, you know, specifically you kind of talked about these two different groups. And again, I'm putting myself in this book as a person who again exists at the intersection of these two spaces, right? As somebody who is a minority, very specifically belongs to a despised minority, um, being an American Muslim, um, but also somebody who advocates for the rights of of the precise people that you know many Americans are opposed to right now in terms of their religious beliefs. Um, that is conservative Christians, and so I'm at this place where I'm just like, you know, I have the ability to see past people saying mean things to me and people, uh, you know, specifically advocating even against my legal rights. I have the ability to sort of see past that and still advocate for their rights, even as much as I don't agree or, um, with some of their their actions and, and their own religious practices. And so that I hope is is the other takeaway that you can be in that space where you can kind of just. Um, you, you yeah, negotiate these issues in the social space in the public discourse, but don't let it get into the space of whether or not people have legal rights. So we have time for this last question right over here. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you presented this evening. Um, it's funny, your last remarks give segue to my question, which is uh, PRRI just released a report on the increasing support of uh, religious based refusal of service. Um, that's evoked by many people who occupy public squares. Um, let's quickly acknowledge that if you do business in a public square, you, you know, you're required to take people equal, equally. But I wonder uh, for you, what does that mean both extra in an extra legal fashion as well as uh, the social notions of civility in the public square? What There's certainly things we can do in response to situations like that, but Here's a, a direct example of, of challenging our legal history and, and the adequacy and the sufficiency of how we reason things out. Right. So the first thing I would point out is that a lot of those cases are, they tend to be presented in public discourses. So it's a lot broader, involving a lot broader claims than they actually do, right? So it's not so much um, somebody refusing service on, uh, to uh, people on the basis of their sexual orientation, but very specifically, it's, for instance, if we're going to use uh, the Christian Baker case, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, in that scenario, it's not just that he was refused, he wasn't refusing to serve gay uh, individuals or gay couples as a general matter, but more so the very specific act of creating a custom wedding cake that he felt was, a, was an act of self-expression um, that should be protected under free speech and also under uh, the free exercise clause because the, the reason for his refusing to engage in that very particular specific act was because he felt that it involved him in the celebration of a marriage that went against his religious beliefs. So I think the first thing to do in negotiating that is to just have an understanding of the narrowness of the issues in these cases as opposed to kind of presenting them in these really broad sweeping ways that only serve to you know, further inflame uh, the public discourse. And then quite separately, once we've kind of figured out what's legally at stake, I think we have to understand the pow powerful role of, of the social space, right? So it's, instead of saying that all these things need to be litigated and that we need to then sue people for discrimination, try to figure this out and force judges to get involved, um, we need to, and I think the Supreme Court is, is generally trying to avoid that, kind of just saying, can you guys sort of figure it out on your own? Is there a way that we can that we can speak with each other in ways that we understand where each other's concerns are coming from, that we can kind of look past our particular uh, fears and anxieties and, and other concerns about other people and just see that, and one of the, 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 the possible effects of that is the types of, um, you know, uh, opposition that people might have on the basis of their religious beliefs to engaging in these acts, that might that might in itself just be resolved. Maybe people, if we can speak to each other with civility and understand each other, maybe we won't even have a space where people feel the need to, to object, um, right? So the, the, the space of religion is one that's open to so much discourse and, and conversation and negotiation and reinterpretation and religious freedom makes that possible, right? And it, it makes it possible not just for people with conservative leanings, but it makes it also possible with people with progressive leanings to be able to engage with the other side and to come up with new interpretations of, of their respective religions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.